Welcome back to another incredibly high yield video brought to you by Dirty Medicine. In today's video, I'm going to be teaching you about the different types of shock. Now, I hope that you're calm. I hope that you're not having a panic attack. The things that you need to focus on when you're learning the different types of shock are two main high yield points. And I'm going to pay special attention to these two points as I move throughout the video today. The first is the pathophysiology. So we've got five different types of shock, okay? And in these five different types of shock, you need to understand what is going on with the pathophysiology that takes you from the underlying insult or the underlying problem and ultimately leads to shock, okay? The second thing that you need to know is what's happening to all of our different cardiogenic parameters and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. But what's happening to all of our different cardiogenic parameters in each of these different types of shock? Now, when I say cardiogenic parameters, I'm talking about things like what's happening to cardiac output, what's happening to heart rate, what's happening to the systemic vascular resistance, what's happening to the oxygen saturation, what's happening to the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So all of these different things that I've just mentioned can be measured and they're different in each of these five different types of shock. So on USMLE and on Comlex, the test writers have an awesome question that they can ask you. They can describe a type of shock either by telling you the name of the shock directly or telling you about the insult or the underlying pathophysiology and forcing you to recognize which type of shock it is and then they can ask you a really challenging question such as which of the following sets of up down arrows might you expect to find and what they'll do is they'll have this tidy little chart with all of those things I just mentioned cardiac output heart rate etc and they'll have up and down arrows and you'll have to pick the right answer so because there's so much information that you need to know about the different types of shock the underlying pathophysiology what's happening and how all of those cardiogenic parameters change this is a topic that medical students hate. So my goal in this video is to first go through all of the shock types one at a time. And before we even get into that, I'll start with a little flow chart that'll help you conceptualize the different types of shock. We'll talk about each type of shock individually, paying special attention to the causes and the underlying pathophysiology. And as I move through this video, we'll create a chart with all of those up down arrows that you need to know. So this video is shock. Now the first way that you should think about shock is how do you conceptualize this into its different types? So the first question that we should ask ourselves is what's the main problem that's going on in order to determine which type of shock we're dealing with? And really what I'm talking about are three different things. Option one, the heart doesn't work. Option two, there's a change in fluid status or option three, which is sort of a more specific version of option two, there's low levels of fluid. If the heart doesn't work, we're talking about cardiogenic shock. If there's a change in fluid status, we're talking about distributive shock. And don't get overwhelmed by the term distributive. Think about it. If there's a change in fluid status, there is a change in the distribution or distributive, there's a change in the distribution of fluid in the body. And if there's simply low levels of fluid, we're talking about hypovolemic shock. So it should be rather easy to conceptualize this so far. If the heart doesn't work, it's cardiogenic. Kind of makes sense because cardio is in the name. If there's a change in the distribution of fluid or a change in fluid status, it's distributive shock. And if there's low fluid, it's hypovolemic shock. And after all, hypovolemic means low volume. Now, let's touch on one more question that we need to ask ourselves. If you look at distributive shock, this is technically an umbrella term that can describe three different types of shock. So distributive shock itself is really three different types. So the next question that you need to ask if you've determined that the problem is a change in the fluid status, but we're not talking about hypovolemic shock. The next thing is you say, well, what's the underlying problem? And this can be three different underlying problems, which will help us better classify which type of distributive shock we're actually talking about. So this is a specifier because distributive, so distributive shock 
is an umbrella term that really describes three different types of subtypes of shock. Now, what's the underlying problem if we've already determined that this is distributive? Well, you can have an abnormal response to an infection, you can have a loss of sympathetic tone, or you can have an anaphylactic reaction. Now, if it's an abnormal response to, the, to an infection, we're dealing with septic shock. If we've lost sympathetic tone, and I'll get into how exactly that happens, but if we've lost sympathetic tone, then we're dealing with neurogenic shock. And if it is an anaphylactic reaction, then of course, as the name implies, we're dealing with anaphylactic shock. So this is how I conceptualize the different types of shock. And as you can see by reading this flowchart, I try to keep it rather stupid and simple, right? Heart doesn't work, change in fluids, low fluids, abnormal infection, loss of sympathetics, or anaphylaxis. So these are our five different types of shock. We've got cardiogenic, septic, neurogenic, anaphylactic, and hypovolemic. Again, all of distributive shock really refers to three different subtypes, and that's septic, neurogenic, and anaphylactic. So now that I've shown you how to conceptualize this in your brain, I think it would be a good idea if I went through each of these types of shock, the five different types, one at a time, talked about the underlying causes and the underlying pathophysiology, and then we'll wrap up each type of shock with that that nice chart with the up down arrows and I'll, I'll even throw in some mnemonics at the end so let's start with cardiogenic shock and again this is because the heart won't work hence the name cardiogenic so you've got some type of underlying event that damages the heart and when the heart gets damaged this causes a decrease in cardiac output a decrease in blood pressure and of course as a result a decrease in tissue perfusion now this is going to cause three things to happen. The first is that you're going to get an increased release of catecholamines. And catecholamines, of course, cause vasoconstriction. The next thing that you're going to get is activation of the RAAS system. Now, this will also cause vasoconstriction and it will also cause the retention of sodium and free fluid to attempt to correct the decrease in cardiac output. And the last thing that you'll get is the shunting of blood to the brain and the vital organs. Because after all, if the heart is having some type of issue and can only supply a little amount of blood, then the body preferentially wants that blood to reach the brain and the vital organs, and it's willing to sacrifice what's considered non-vital organs. So these changes, these compensatory mechanisms lead to one thing, and that's an increase in the myocardial work and oxygen demand. Because think about it, with more vasoconstriction and more retention of sodium and free fluid and shunting of blood to other areas that otherwise would not normally have blood shunted to them, the, the, the demand on the heart is going to increase. But as you can quickly see, that is problematic because the underlying event is that the heart has a problem and can't pump. So when you get this compensatory mechanism that demands more work on an already dysfunctional heart, this makes cardiogenic shock worse and ultimately leads to death. So as I've summarized on this slide, the pathophysiology is a decrease in cardiac output that just gets worse and worse over time. Some common causes of cardiogenic shock, and of course, this is not an all-inclusive list, it's just some common causes, are heart attacks, cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, drug-induced cardiogenic shock, so stimulants like cocaine or methamphetamine, arrhythmia, septal defects or ruptured valves, anything that damages the heart, either directly or indirectly, can cause cardiogenic shock. So very, very high yield to understand the pathophysiology you see on this slide, and very, very important to understand that there are several different causes that can all damage the heart and lead to the same end result. So let's talk about those up-down arrows that you need to know for test day. So our first type of shock is cardiogenic shock. And as you see on this slide, these are the changes for cardiac output, heart rate, central venous pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, systemic vascular resistance, and oxygen saturation. So it's cardiogenic, so cardiac output is down, but the heart rate is increasing in attempt to compensate for the decreased cardiac output. Central venous pressure will either be not changed or increased. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be increased because all of that fluid that can't be pumped is just sitting there in the pulmonary capillaries. The systemic vascular resistance is increasing as part of the compensation. And of course, our oxygen saturation 
is down. So that's cardiogenic shock. Take a little bit of time and rewind the video if you want to hear me explain these up down arrows once again. But if we go back to our flow chart, we've already covered one of five of the types of shock that you need to know. So cardiogenic shock, heart doesn't work, done. You guys are cruising. Let's move on to hypovolemic shock. And then we'll wrap up at the end with distributive since it actually has three different subtypes. So hypovolemic shock, what's going on? Well, there's some underlying event that causes a loss of fluid, okay? So fluid is leaking out of the pipes, and that's going to decrease the intravascular volume in the body. Now, when this happens, you should think of two different causes. A decrease in intravascular volume has two different causes, and they're either considered hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic. And what, what you should think of if this is too complex for you, although I hope it's not, is that is the problem due to blood or is the problem due to water? So when we lose intravascular volume, we can either lose blood or we can lose water. So hemorrhagic causes all lose blood. So you want to think of things like trauma, right? Somebody gets hit with a baseball bat and they you know they get hit in the stomach and all of a sudden their spleen just hemorrhages into their abdomen. Or maybe someone gets stabbed with a knife right in the heart and all of a sudden they're just squirting blood out of their chest. Okay, so those are hemorrhagic causes of intravascular volume loss. The other thing that can happen is GI bleed. So things that anything that will cause a GI bleed, whether it's an ulcer or some type of esophageal varicine, anything along those lines that causes a massive blood loss decreases the intravascular volume. And the other big one that you want to keep in mind is postpartum hemorrhage. Now, those are all blood problems, right? Hemorrhagic blood loss. But on the other side of the equation, you can have a decreased intravascular volume due to water problems. So just like you can lose blood on the left, you can lose water on the right. So how do we lose water? Well, diarrhea, vomiting, burns, salt wasting, all of these different types of pathologies cause a decreased intravascular volume due to water problems, water loss. So in either event, the intravascular volume is down, and that is how you get hypovolemic shock. So now let's talk about some up-down arrows. Here's where we are with hypovolemic shock. So cardiac output is going to be down because there's simply not enough volume and therefore not enough cardiac output to circulate that decreased volume. But the heart rate is going to be up to try to compensate. Central venous pressure will either be unchanged or down because volume is down. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will also be down because there's less fluid sitting in the pulmonary capillaries. The SVR, systemic vascular resistance, will be up because the body's trying to compensate for that hypovolemic shock. And oxygen saturation will, of course, be down. On two major types of shock, we had cardiogenic, where the heart doesn't work, and then hypovolemic, where there's low fluid either due to blood loss or water loss. Now let's talk about the different types of distributive shock. So remember that when we talked about distributive shock, we had to ask a second question. And that second question was, what's the underlying problem? This can either be an abnormal response to an infection, the loss of sympathetic tone, or anaphylaxis. When we talk about the abnormal response to an infection, we're talking about septic shock. And in septic shock, you have the introduction of a foreign pathogen that causes the release of acute phase reactants and causes massive vasodilation in an inflammatory reaction. In loss of sympathetic tone or neurogenic shock, there's some injury to either the brain or the spinal cord, which decreases the body's ability to use its sympathetic tone AKA the body cannot vasoconstrict. And if the body cannot vasoconstrict, it's going to vasodilate. Okay. And when anything vasodilates, whether it's septic due to pathogens or neurogenic due to a spinal cord injury and subsequent loss of sympathetic tone, all changes in vasodilation will cause a change in the distribution of fluid. And that's why this is a type of distributive shock. Now, in anaphylaxis, you're obviously having an anaphylactic reaction, and this is an IgE-mediated type 1 hypersensitivity reaction that causes changes in histamine and mast cells, which also leads to a massive vasodilation, but this is mediated because of a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Again, in all three of these types of distributive shock, the underlying problem is technically functionally the same. You're having either a vasodilation or an inability to vasoconstrict, causing an indirect vasodilation. 
And in all of those scenarios, you're changing the distribution of fluid in the body, hence the name distributive shock. So now let's go back to these really high yield up down arrows. What you'll notice for the different types of distributive shock is that in septic shock, the cardiac output is actually going to be up because remember, this is a response to an inflammatory reaction. And therefore the body is trying to compensate for that by dispersing more blood throughout the body to fight and eradicate said infection. Also, heart rate will be up for the same reason. Now, central venous pressure is going to be unchanged or down because as the body continuously vasodilates, then that central venous pressure will drop. And likewise, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will drop because less blood is sitting in the pulmonary capillaries since the body is undergoing massive vasodilation. Systemic vascular resistance is obviously down. And of note, systemic vascular resistance will be down in all three types of distributive shock because the common commonality between them is that all three of these distributive types of shock feature vasodilation or indirectly vasodilation by inability to vasoconstrict. Oxygen saturation is actually up in septic shock, and we'll come back to this exception in just a moment. Now, in neurogenic shock, the cardiac output is down and the heart rate is down. In this case, it's the inability to use sympathetic tone. And because sympathetic tone is a major driver and mediator of cardiac output and heart rate, both of those factors are down. Central venous pressure is unchanged or down because you simply don't have the sympathetic drive to maintain your cardiac output, so there's not enough pressure in the system. Because there's not enough pressure in the system, there's less circulating free blood, which means that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is also down. Because this is an inability to vasoconstrict, and therefore you're indirectly vasodilating, your systemic vascular resistance is down, and like all of the types of shock with the exception of septic, which again, we'll come back to in just a second, oxygen saturation is down. Let's wrap up with the up-down arrows for anaphylactic shock. Now this is, again, a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction mediated by IgE with also some help by the mast cells and histamine and all that stuff that you learned in immunology. In this case, cardiac output is down. It simply cannot keep up with the demand due to the massive vasodilation. Heart rate, however, will compensate. There's no problem with sympathetic tone in anaphylactic shock. In neurogenic shock, you do have a problem with sympathetics and therefore heart rate cannot compensate. But in anaphylactic shock, heart rate is certainly compensating. Central venous pressure and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and systemic vascular resistance are all down because the anaphylactic shock is still a vasodilatory process. And therefore, when that vasodilation occurs, you have less blood in your central venous system, less blood in your pulmonary capillaries, and obviously SVR is down because you're simply vasodilating. Oxygen saturation is also down. Now, I told you that an exception to the rule with oxygen saturation was in septic shock. And this is beyond the purpose of this discussion. You don't really need to know this for USMLE and Comlex, but just briefly, oxygen saturation will be up, but oxygen delivery will be down. So even though there's more oxygen saturation, and this is a byproduct of any inflammatory process, the actual delivery of that oxygen to target tissues is down. But when you're looking at a chart, you'll see that arrow going up because oxygen saturation itself is increased. The way that you should memorize this is to remember that septic equals sat. Just match up those S's. Septic shock is the one where sat is up. So septic is sat. Just remember that septic goes with sat and you'll remember that it's the exception to this rule. The other exception that you should take close, uh, pay close attention to is neurogenic shock with heart rate being down. In all of these types of shock, heart rate is up because it's trying to compensate, but in neurogenic shock, you don't have the sympathetic tone required to drive that heart rate to compensate for the decreased cardiac output. And because of that, you can remember this as saying neurogenic has no heart rate compensation. So just like we matched those S's for septic and sat, for neurogenic, we match those N's for neurogenic and no. Now let me pause for a second because this is the end of the video. This is incredibly high yield and I hope that you understand this discussion and can reason through these up down arrows. If you're taking your tests and have trouble recalling these, I think that the best way to go about this is not to memorize it, but rather to reason through it. Ask yourself, what's gonna happen if the heart you know, tears a hole in it? How will cardiac output change? How will heart rate change, et cetera, et cetera. And if you reason through it, it should make sense. Good luck and keep getting those points.